Chapter 2, Overcoming Stumbling Blocks, Part 1. I asked God if it was okay to be melodramatic, and she said yes. I asked her if it was okay to be short, and she said it sure is. I asked her if I could wear nail polish or not wear nail polish, and she said, honey, she calls me that sometimes. She said, you can do just exactly what you want to. Thanks, God, I said. And is it even okay if I don't paragraph my letters? Sweet cakes, God said. Who knows where she picked that up? What I'm telling you is yes, yes, yes. By Kaylin Hout. Get your rubble on, the power of breaking rules. What keeps you from making? I'll admit to days when I spent most of the time thinking about going to the studio without ever going there once. Sure, there's a laundry list of other stuff that needs to be done. Some of it isn't negotiable if you have kids, aging parents, or the plumbing is backed up and the bathroom is flooding. Priorities are priorities and there's no way around the urgency of a flat tire or the fact that you're going to be late for work if you don't get moving. Bottom line, life enters in. But in and around life happening are portions of time just waiting to be dealt a creative hand. Don't you want to grab that time and go? Get busy? Make something? In this chapter, we consider common obstacles that squelch good intentions and flummox budding practices. And we engage a little rebel energy to break a few rules and think about charting a plan. On an airplane, they tell you to put on your own oxygen mask first before helping the person next to you. It's a good life strategy. Engage your rebel energy and protect the time that isn't co-opted by higher priorities. Even a brief stint in the studio has the potential to be a great stint in the studio. You just have to open the door and walk into the room. Obstacles to working. Here are obstacles that keep people from going to the studio. Not an exhaustive list by any stretch, but a few of these will probably resonate. Not having enough time. I've only got 15 minutes, an hour, a morning, an hour after dinner. I won't get anything done in that much time, so why bother? Having too much time. If you have loads of time, it's harder to discipline yourself to go into the studio and begin. There isn't any sense of urgency and time fritters away. No clear action plan. If you don't anticipate how you'll spend the time, it's hard to be directed or enthusiastic about how to spend the time. Fear of failure. What if I spend all that time in there and I hate what I did? It'll be a waste of time. Fear of success. What if I make something great and I get in a show and then I win an award and my whole life changes? We have an amazing capacity as humans to turn something really good into something potentially bad. That is, if I'm a success, my friends won't like me anymore or fill in the blank. If this resonates with you, get a reality check. Don't you deserve a life populated by people who support you through both failure and success? I can't afford, I don't know where to get, I don't know what I need. This refers to materials and supplies. It's an easy problem to solve as long as you quit feeling sorry and stuck and do a little research. Don't you really want to do this? Now let's talk about Tyree Guyton and the Heidelberg Project. 27 years ago, Guyton co-opted a couple of houses on Detroit's east side. Using a variety of discarded objects, he proceeded to turn two blocks of abandoned houses into the Heidelberg Project. Recognized around the world for demonstrating the power of creativity to change lives. Several houses were set on fire by arsonists, some rumored to have been set by the city. Guyton and the project participants never gave up. Their passionate desire to reclaim forgotten neighborhoods engages school children, patrons, and residents. You can look up the Heidelberg Project online. Tyree Guyton is a rebel artist to the extreme. Most of us will never be that extreme, and we don't need to be. 
but most of us could benefit from embracing and encouraging the rebel artist part of ourselves. We've all got one. Human beings are hardwired hard -wired with a DNA strand of rebel personality because it assisted our ancestors' survival against massive environmental and physical odds. If you didn't question the world around you, on the tundra or the jungle, there was a good chance you were self-selected out. Rebelliousness was distilled into us as the species evolved. There's another aspect of the rebel artist to consider. Let's talk about archetypes. Psychologist Carl Jung described archetypes as universal patterns of human behavior located in the human collective unconscious. Caroline Mace expanded Jung's original precepts in her contemporary writings. Archetypes are symbolic patterns we recognize in each other all the time. We use terms like Earth Mother or we say someone is a prince of a guy. The terms are so universal they're sort of a shorthand for behavior, even when we don't consciously think about it. There are hundreds of archetypes. Using archetypal language allows us to take an impersonal, symbolic look at ourselves, and that can help us become better artists. Back to the rebel archetype. We already have a rebellious streak because of our evolutionary wiring. Add an option to engage the re rebel archetype actively in order to strengthen commitment to making, and you are working with powerful energy. Your rebel will help protect studio time and further strength training by supporting your questioning of the world around you. As with all things, this takes practice. Rebelling might be in our DNA, but that doesn't mean we're always comfortable with it. Being a team player, fitting in, these community building postures encourage sublimation of rebellious inclinations. But in the studio, you can't afford to sit back or lay low. Your rebel artist knows you have a right to studio time and gives you permission to break the rules. But first you have to notice the rules as they apply to you. Rules you've embraced consciously or unconsciously that curtail your highest potential in the studio. Only you can actively list the rules of your life. A partner might be able to help and that would be good because you would both be more conscious of what your agreed upon rules are. Take something simple like doing the dishes. Is there a rule in your house or in your head that the dishes must be done by a certain time, like right after the meal? Are there rules about making the bed or folding the laundry? Everyone has house rules and personal rules. Some rules are not negotiable, like I am definitely going to clean the cat box when I wake up in the morning or I'll pay. However, loads of rules could stand to be broken or at least negotiated. Inventory the vast set of rules that function in your life. Decide which ones are worth it and which ones are time wasters. If there's a rule you abide by every day, but you could let it go once a week, think it over. Your rebel artist needs more studio time. Check it out. We haven't even started about art rules yet. Here are a few familiar rules of art and making. You don't know how to draw unless you take a class. Your quilting stitches have to be 12 to the inch or you'll burn in hell. The art police rule and they're watching you. You should always bind the edges of a quilt. You should never bind the edges of a quilt. Work should be archival so it will never age, fall apart, or deconstruct. We should all be so archival. You can't call yourself an artist unless you've got a lot of nerve. Someone else has to bestow the title upon you. Those are the scads of art rule examples. Contemplate a few to which you may have fallen prey. Contemplate the bill of bad goods you've been sold. Call out your righteous rebel and vow to break a few rules. It's good for your creative stamina. <laughs>